Hi guys, uh, I loved the movie, and I'm sure you've heard that a lot on your multiple <laughs> interviews across your press tour. But it's be it's just such a charming film. I'm gonna I'm gonna begin um, with a question for both of you, really, which is I'm just interested in kind of writing the writing dynamic. I just wondered how it kind of works when putting together a screenplay as a duo. Do you sit down and write together in front of a kind of one screen, sort of knocking, uh, sort of throwing ideas around, or do you both go off, write different scenes, and then bring it together? What's your what's your kind of working style? Well, we actually wrote this in different places. So I was in Boston and Kern was in LA and we exchanged pages and we never actually worked on it simultaneously. We never did like a collaborate session where you have one screen um, that you're looking at at the same time. Um, and the way we did it in general, very broad strokes term is that Kern is more of a comedy person and I'm more of a drama structure person. So we played to our strengths in the writing that we did. And then we combined it um in a cohesive narrative <laughs> hopefully yeah Roshan has been writing for almost a decade professionally so one of the things he always talks about is writers knowing their blind spots and early on we identified okay my blind spot is maybe more drama because I've I'm more inclined towards comedy and his is maybe more comedy so anytime we had a uh, sort of uh, issue where we're like we're not agreeing on this scene or a piece of dialogue or anything if it was more of a comedic thing we would hear each other out and then I would sort of get the final say. And if it was more of a dramatic thing, he would. And it weirdly turned out to be a very smooth process yeah. because of that. Um, we just care about different things. I'm obsessed with structure too. And I did not want this to feel like a string of funny scenes in a house. So well, I was, you know, all about shaping and molding. Um, yeah. And Kern was maybe more about generating. <laughs> so we figured it, we figured it out between the two of us, but we, you know, we're a couple too romantic couple so it, <laughs> it was interesting to write together which we had actually um experimented with before but never like this um and uh we wrote this very quickly and with literally no conflict <laughs> just in five days it just spilled out of us it was like um we were working in concert in a weird way even when we weren't communicating explicitly as, as a couple was it quite important to discuss like other things other than this during the production not get too kind of embroiled in the project because when working so closely on something it must dominate so many conversations at kind of at dinner time and stuff yeah. I don't know if we really did talk about anything else I just no. feel like there was nothing else to talk about like what else was there to do this was uh you know summer September 2020 and prep was summer shooting was September and it was you know there was like nobody was doing anything you weren't seeing anybody mm -hmm. you couldn't go to a gym class you could just walk outside and like think about what life used to be like and what it hopefully would be like in the future and that was really the reason that the movie came into existence is out of all of that frustration and and sense of arrested development and stalling that everyone felt so yeah. we were delighted to have this to talk about I will say when we were shooting, we were so fried from filming every day that we did unwind by watching Selling Sunset in yeah. our Airbnb. Yeah, we finished the entire season. Yeah, and it really saved our brains uh, to just shut off and watch um, LA real estate. You yeah, know, I highly recommend. <laughs> but uh, Karen, did you did you always know when um, when writing this that it would be yourself playing uh, playing Ravi? Yeah, I will say that's a big motivation for me when it comes to writing. I've learned is that if I can, I primarily, my first joy is performing. And so if I can, if I know it's leading to that in some shape or form, I'm like trying to get that hit, that performing hit, um, I will be more motivated to write. So I think that was a big thing, but also just practically speaking, you know, this was the first time we were making a feature film there were so many unknowns. So I think for us, like one, we were like, well, if it's really a two-hander and we know 50% of it is me, we know that I won't be a diva and I won't complain and <laughs> I'll work for close to free. So um, that, you know, is helpful as well. Um, but yeah, no, this was definitely always from the beginning uh, sort of, and that made the writing fun too, because we were trying to sort of write things that were more in my voice and yeah. Yeah, that one man stand up was one of the. Oh my gosh, that's like my I love bad stand up, and I sort of like I find bad stand up more funny than good stand up, and that was like early on. I was like, we have to have a scene where like there's really bad stand up. Like he loves stand up and he's so bad at it, and that was really fun to write just bad jokes. <laughs> so how did um, Geraldine uh, come on board, and what made her the perfect reader? Yeah, we have known each other since 2017. We are on a t uh, TV show together called Miracle Workers with the uh, British heartthrob Daniel Radcliffe. Um, and um, so we basically 
uh, have known each other for a while and we were writing it with her in mind and we didn't know if she would want to do it or, or whatever and then she was the first person we sent it to and she read it very quickly and said yes and we really didn't have a plan b so we were really happy that she agreed to do it because she brings so much to it yeah. of course like you mentioned you guys sort of go back i mean you hear of actors who uh, hate each other having to pretend to be in love on screen but, but you and geraldine are good friends did that make the opposite quite tricky the scenes where the characters weren't clicking because i get i always feel like faking chemistry almost seems easier than ridding yourself of it if that makes sense <laughs> really good question no one has asked that question um yeah i think uh, yeah that was actually now that i think about it i was a little bit nervous about uh, in the beginning, it feeling like I'm too comfortable with her, I guess, like, because we were also like staying in the same Airbnb and like hanging out all the time and have known each other. And so I, that was like at the back of my mind, like always to be like, you don't know this person and you're really uncomfortable, but it made the other side of it easier. Yeah. But, um, she's so good that when she was sort of in the scene with you, you just, you just play off of that energy, I think. Do you think there are shades of both characters in both of you? I feel like we're all a sort of sort of an amalgamation of Rita and Ravi. <laughs> yeah, I think when you write characters, you often write in extreme broad strokes and you have to, and people always want subtlety out of character, but in the beginning, you really can't be, otherwise people won't grasp it. So you have to write in a simpler way than reflects the reality of how we are and how we interact with each other. But yeah, the, the, car the character that Curran plays is more or less an exaggerated version of him, especially early on in our relationship. Um, where he was more uh, eager, enthusiastic, and more of the driving force. Thirsty. Uh, thirsty. He was really thirsty. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Rita is much more me, especially in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, where she was more withdrawn um, and less, frankly, open to love. But uh, over the course of the movie, of course, it's revealed that she is more tenderhearted than she first let on, which was the case for me, too, over the course of our relationship. And now I trail behind Karen like a lost puppy. But in the beginning, <laughs> you know, it was like, Kern weeping while expressing his love while I just stared at him stone-faced. So we've really come, we've kind of reversed. <laughs> One of the things I was sort of interested in looking at watching this is do you think that traditionalism to some degree is sort of slowly fading? It see, feels like the, the world now has far more Ritas than we do Ravis. And with each passing generation, it just feel like some of those old fashioned values will be lost, which in some cases is, is not the worst thing in the world. But do you feel like as we as we progress through this world that that, that some of the the, 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 the ravis of the world are becoming more and more sort of um, rare, I suppose. Yeah, well, there's tradition in a broader sense and tradition in a culturally specific sense. But for the former, I do think that tradition more or less is going out the window because our world has just changed so utterly and we're, um, we're all adjusting to that. And then in the cultural sense, you know, our parents moved here from India, hoping to keep their culture alive. And they more or less, I think, are fa facing pretty doomed prospects because mm -hmm. you can't keep something as specific as Indian cultural life in America, not the way I think that they originally planned. Many of us who are the children of first generation immigrants do not know the language. We can understand it, but we can't speak it. We don't know all of the customs or the rituals. And so it's going to fade with time, I think, whether anyone likes it or not. Um, I think it's going to disappear a little bit into the melting pot of America, which has happened to many other communities, Italian Americans, Irish Americans. Some of it will survive, but. Why even think that about in, in sort of UK, you look back at old footage, okay. everyone flying their Union Jack flags, and when the Queen comes out, everyone goes crazy. And now everyone my age, you say anything about the monarchy and they kind of roll their eyes. And you just think, as we sort of move forward, just so many yeah, things are just slowly getting more lost as we progress. I didn't know that was changing, um, yeah. the perspective towards the monarchy. But. Um, yeah, it's um, maybe we're just more cynical. <laughs> but yeah. actually, I don't know. but uh, how important is it, though, when when you are displaying cultural traditions in like like arranged marriages to do so without judgment, ir irrespective of your own thoughts? There's a sensitivity, isn't there, when it comes to tradition? And, and you have to be quite delicate, I suppose, when you when you re reflect that in, in, in cinema as an art form. Yeah, it's interesting for us. We didn't think too much about it because we both come from arranged marriages. So to us, like we felt like, or maybe I'll speak for myself, but like the representation of it in Hollywood was so one-sided and it almost felt like barbaric. And I was like, I don't know if this is all like true because we had seen so many examples of it working. And uh, to us, like, you know, it's just a different way of looking at love, which is that instead of like love at first sight, that doesn't really exist. It's more like 
you figure out the practical stuff first, like do your families get along, which in Indian culture is so important. You can't really be married without your families in some way like mingling. Um, so it's like once that's figured out, then you can almost like you have permission to fall in love. And so we just were like, we just, this feels like a fresh thing we haven't really seen. And um, yeah, I don't think we overanalyzed it too much. No, yeah, but there was definitely a desire to show the legitimacy of arranged marriage, because I do think we have seen many of our relatives and our own parents fall in love in ways that I think the West would find really crazy, mm -hmm. um, because they just had to love each other. They just had to. The way you have to love your brother or your sister, no matter who they are, you have to love your husband or your wife. And in many ways, it works as uh, psychotic as that sounds. <laughs> so instead of the Western view of love as something that is almost as if it ha love happens to you, you are struck by lightning in the presence of the one person with whom you are compatible. The Eastern or the Indian at least view of love is that it's something that you build practically over time with another person who is hopefully pretty much you know, of the same background. Um, so they're, they're very different ways of falling in love, but one isn't more legitimate than the other. And one isn't more psychotic than the other, but they're both like, uh, they're both um, pretty unreasonable when you think about it. But I think we think too often of love as something that is like special and has to be found rather than built and maintained every single day as we do in our own relationship. Yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned the way it can be sort of depicted in in, in Hollywood and kind of Western sort of cinema and in, in art. And I mean, but this, I mean, when it comes to representation, there is a problem, obviously, in Hollywood with ensuring authentic depictions of of, of different cultures from around the world. Is that what, what, what partly what makes it good when you guys write together? Is you get to write and just go, look, we're we're not taking a script and really flicking through it, going, oh my god, no, you know, a character like this. You get to go, this is who we are, and this is the this is how this is the life. This is the people we know and the life that we know, and we're telling it to you. Is that is that something that drives you when you when you tell stories is to say to, to do so from a, a point of authenticity, I suppose. Yeah, I think we're very much concerned with authenticity. But the other great thing is that we don't have the burden of writing these characters primarily with a view towards making them Indian because we're just writing human beings and they happen to be Indian. And I think that's it's that lack of interiority and humanity that um, a lot of other art suffers from when it comes to diverse characters because the people writing them aren't diverse and they become so concerned with treating them tenderly and cautiously in all the right politically correct ways that they forgive them to they forget to give them the complexity and humanity that they deserve. Mm -hmm. So I think what what is great is because we are Indian and human <laughs> it's very easy for us to write people who are the same. Yeah, and I think also like for us like there's just so many stories that were like haven't been told and as like cliche or whatever as that sounds but when we were in coming up for ideas for this we always wanted to do something in this space of like modern arranged marriages because we were like this world is really insane and unique that you're dating through your mothers and the whole thing was like so funny to me and no one is doing that and so we we're always like there's so many stories there's so many things that we've experienced that have just not translated in American movies. Um, and so it's always exciting to even explore that, to be like, this feels fresh and original. And, new. and ever since Crazy Rich Asians, you know, there's been this like quest to pull back the curtain on some grand new cultural vista. When the truth is that we're all pretty much the same and our stories and our concerns are pretty much the same too. In Crazy Rich Asians, it's obviously about getting her mother-in-law's approval, which is a story that is not specific to Asian culture. Um, and I hope that's the case for 70s too. Uh, whatever the specifics are, it's all the same story. We're all battling with how to find and create love. And one thing, another thing, obviously, we've all been battling with uh, recent years is COVID, of course, which is, is, is part is mentioned at times uh, during this. Um, the, the, some of the, the dialogue and the language that you would have written back then, you know, just talking about Mars, talking about sort of leaving the house and can you go out and see friends and stuff. It now is, is just ordinary dialogue that we have every single day with people. But were you ever worried when writing this at the time that making it, put, injecting COVID into it could have tied it too close to a certain time in, in or was that was that part of the appeal in some ways because I guess now actually it doesn't feel like it is part of a time capsule it feels very much like it's just the way the world is now but were you ever ap apprehensive about that when you when you first injected COVID into the to the narrative? Probably weren't as worried as we should have been we really just wrote <laughs> it in the spirit of this is what we're feeling right at the time I do think you shouldn't create art defensively worried about the future or worried about how it will survive or what its legacy be will be or how it will be received because the more you do that the less good the art is in general so we created it with very few thoughts yeah it just felt organic to this story we were like uh we were working through like 
kind of in the classic Duplass brothers way with limitations. And so we were like, it looks like we'll have one or two locations, a few actors. And we're like, what's the story? The most important thing in Russian would always say this is, this movie can't be boring. It has to have a purpose to exist beyond like, we needed to make a movie during COVID. <laughs> and, um, and so we were like, what is the story that excites us? And then it sort of became more and more like these two mismatched people who met on this website. And then we were like, why would they not just go out into the world? And then it organically became like, what if it is COVID? And like, then what does that mean? Like they're forced to sort of re-examine their lives like a lot of us have. And it just so organically fit in. We've written other things since that haven't been as COVID heavy just because the story didn't feel like it needed it. But this really felt like it was sort of examining all those things of, you know, there would be no movie if there was no COVID in this because they would have had a really bad first date and never spoken to each other again. And this really forced you to, like a lot of people, I think in COVID to re-examine your life choices because you were forced to and see things uh, in a different way. Yeah, the, in terms of what um, what uh, felt too much like a time capsule there, there, we only caught one scene in this entire movie, which was mm -hmm. a scene of him washing his hands. And I'm really glad we did actually in a lot of ways because that feels dated now. Mm -hmm. Because we obviously now know COVID is not spread as much through um, contacts. Rather, it's, in, you know, airborne such droplet disease yeah it's fine I, 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 just on, on this i've actually got covid at the moment funny enough <laughs> yeah. no, i'm so, so sorry how are you doing i did a i had to do a, for a job yesterday i did a, a covid test you know a lateral flow and it came back positive so i'm isolating for a few days i don't know yeah, i know there's an uptick, still, in, still there's an uptick in europe i'm assuming you're in england i don't know if that's yeah, okay yeah. but I mean, um one in 15 people have got it at the moment in england which is a lot <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's yeah, not we, uh, <laughs> um, I had, we both had a similar thing where we ended up just testing for something and then it came positive in January. So, yeah, yeah, it's partly why some of these Zoom interviews are good because it means I can still do this. If this was in person today, I would have had to cancel. But um, I was, was going <laughs> to uh, obviously you mentioned the Duplass brothers uh, just before. I mean, they're, they're, I, I mean, I still think Jeffrey Lives at Home is one of my favorite films of the last sort of 20 years. But that kind of mumblecore style felt like a bit of a kind of movement. But it's had a really lasting effect, hasn't it? Do you think that they were part of a style that, that, that we see in Seven Days? It's actually changed the whole face of, of filmmaking. Um, indie filmmaking sorry in america yeah i think mumblecore when it originated was a movement against the studio films of the day and the idea that you couldn't tell human stories mm -hmm. in modest circumstances um and that spirit remains very much alive including in this movie and mumblecore has had many imitators some successful and some not and i think when it doesn't work it's because there is no story so it's not enough for people to mumble in a room um it has to be you know, there, something has to happen. It has to be like a play. Yeah. Sorry. You know, I, I, I'm not one for needless sequels, but I really want to spend more time with these two. Have you, have you even had any conversations about doing something again with, with these two characters, even if it's just a kind of something on YouTube or something? I, I, I mean, obviously I know sometimes things are better just left as they are, but the second this movie finished, I was like, I just want to go back in that room with them. You could have made this film called 14 Days. I would have been more than happy, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> well, Arshan has some ideas. He always yeah, has ideas. <laughs> I always have just random plans because nobody <laughs> is clamoring for a sequel at the moment. But if we did one, I would love to do the first week of them bringing their newborn home because that week is obviously quite fraught for a lot of reasons. And then I would love to do the first week of um, them signing their divorce papers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe get them cooking again. I, was, I mean, that yeah, didn't yeah. like the Doesn't worst. mean they get divorced, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't like the worst yeah. pasta dish I've, I've ever seen uh, with my own eyes. What, 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 what would you, to, what would you? <laughs> that was so gross. Oh yeah. my God. But what, what would you be your signature dish if you guys had to if you had if you had someone around that you had to cook for what would you what would you cook for them well i'd love to hear his answer yeah because karen's a cook yeah i i do cook uh, as much as i can um but yeah italian food is like my because i just know i can do a good job i stopped eating meat a few years ago but i used to like spaghetti and meatballs was like my big thing but i would do like beyond meatballs now. Mm. but uh, what's yours <laughs> well i don't make anything yeah, so the what, only thing i do is i put cheese a slice of cheese on a slice of bread right at the fridge and then i eat it there at the fridge that's literally the most i've ever manufactured anything but i couldn't do anything beyond that i can make porridge from instant oatmeal i can i don't know what can i make yeah i think that's what i melt right. cheese on bread sometimes yeah but i would have nothing <laughs> i would have absolutely nothing to offer and i would just offer my mind and my companionship <laughs> 
rather well, than me. <laughs> that's okay. not enough. Not the right person. <laughs> You'd be the snack. You're the physical yeah. snack. Yeah, your full meal. I would say that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> my uh, my final question, if you're not necessarily uh, is being a chef is not going to be another career for you. I was reading that you are a physician too. Is well. are you still working both jobs? Or have you now taken up filmmaking yes. and writing? So, yeah, I still work in both jobs. I work as a doctor for nine weeks of the year at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Dana Farber Cancer Institute, um, and I do palliative uh, radiation oncology. I do that, like I said, for nine weeks and the rest of the year, I'm writing or directing. Wow, incredible. Well, wow. it's amazing what you guys do. And I like if, if you do ever make this film about that first week with a the newborn, then um, yeah, hopefully I'll get to speak to you again. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank well, you for wanting to see that. <laughs> no, no, it's really, it sounds great. Anyway, thank you so much for the time today, guys. Best thing with the rest with the release of the movie. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll catch up again one day. Who knows? Yeah, and I hope you have a quick and easy recovery. Yeah, me too. I feel, as you can see, I feel, I feel all right. So I think it's just a matter yeah. of staying indoors and not getting too not going too stir crazy but i'll be fine i've been here before <laughs> yeah. yeah i know <laughs> feel better yeah well, take care guys bye-bye ladies and gentlemen you're watching hey you guys hey you guys huh hey, you guys. is yeah. that from the goonies it is indeed, yeah. nice hey you guys